From the Tetons to the top of the world, meet the first Americans to climb Mount Everest 50 years ago, and the author who told their story. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. The Tetons, the Bighorn Range, the Wind River Range, just some of the high places you will find them. Climbers working to achieve their next goal. And for a group of climbers half a century ago, that goal was to become the first Americans to climb Mount Everest. I'll talk with Brote Coburn, author of a new book about that adventure in just a bit. But first, let's meet some of the mountaineering men who made mountaineering history. The highest mountain in the world, the highest point on the planet. What the hell? You bet I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> the first in would be the first up. On May 1st, 1963, Jim Whitaker became the first American to summit Mount Everest. <laughs> Fifty years later, three surviving members of that expedition gathered in Jackson, Wyoming, for a celebration and a new book about their exploits by Wyoming author Brote Coburn. Well, uh, obviously to go back to 1963, uh, you didn't know there would be success ahead. All you knew, I guess, was that it was going to be a really tough expedition. What made you decide to get on board? I hesitated to get on board because I knew it was going to be a big whoop de doo but with two friends that I'd been on Masherbrum uh, in 1963, two Tetonians, Willie Unsold and Dick Emerson, uh, we decided that if we'd all go together, we'd go together. And, you know, Everest is Everest, and back then it was still very early in the game. So uh, it was the opportunity to be together uh, on a challenging experience. Early indeed. By today's standards, the equipment and supplies were primitive. Hornbein and the others knew they were facing a daunting task. After all, since the first British expedition of 1924, six had succeeded in climbing Mount Everest, and 16 had died trying. That didn't stop enthusiastic mountaineers, including several veterans of the Tetons, from signing up. And so, the laborious preparations began. In an era before the convenience of freeze-dried meals, then it was off to Tibet, where Sherpa guides awaited the Americans. 900 porters carried 27 tons of supplies during the month-long journey to base camp, where the climb would begin. Jake Breitenbach was a climber with years of experience in the Tetons and other ranges. On March 23rd, day two of the climb with partner Dick Pownall had gone well. And then they tried getting past the Kumbu Icefall, a frozen minefield of treacherous ice. Only recently has Dick Pownall begun speaking about what happened that day. Up to that point, we'd been uh, walking with hand coils. It was easy. I uh, turned back to Jake and said, Jake, uh, take a look around that corner because this looks real spooky here. And uh, yeah. looked back at the rope, and with that, that was the end of my memory. A block of ice had fallen, burying a Sherpa, Breitenbach, and Pownall. We were all of us uh, under the ice. Uh, I... Uh, I probably came to some 30 minutes, 45 minutes later when Gil worked up to where we were and chopped, it, chopped me out of the ice. Uh, the only thing showing, I understand, is my hand. Uh, the rest of me was completely buried. You're looking at the luckiest <laughs> climber on the expedition. <clears throat> Jake Breitenbach's body was never found. Well, the first thing I did was have a big fight with the state patrolman who came to tell me about my husband's death. 
His name, Wyoming State Patrolman, was Sonny Langford, and he was a hero in all of our eyes at that time. But I would not listen to him, you know. I told him he was wrong. I told him he was full of da-da-da-da. And so I fought with him for about an hour before I would believe that my husband was dead. It didn't change my ideas about climbing. Climbing was the only thing that Jake Breitenbach really, really cared about with his essence. And so I was glad that he went. And if he had to die, that was a good way for him to die. Not good for me, but good for him. Uh, obviously, one of the lows was when you lost one of your members under an ice avalanche. How did the team recover from that loss? You know, that's a really good question, and I don't know that I have a simple or even any answer to it. Uh, life goes on, and uh, I guess your choices then are to pack up and go home, which logistically was not uh, really in the cards with such a big whoopty, big expedition as that. Uh, and, but, you know, all of us, just like Jake, uh, we were there for an adventure and to test ourselves and to try to climb a mountain. And uh, uh, it just seemed like that's what we needed to continue doing. It was a little unclear for a while that it was going to settle back to normal life and we might have fun doing it again. So one of the comments one of the guys made is, well, let's just climb the damn thing and go home. But pretty over days why you just get back into the game and you go ahead and continue doing what you set out to do. Despite setbacks from bad weather, the American team regrouped and launched an attempt up the southern route by Jim Whitaker and Sherpa Noang Gambu. <laughs> and when you finally did make it after all that, that you went through, what was that feeling like? There was no other feeling. I had no feeling. I was out of bottle oxygen. It was 35 below zero. The winds were 50 miles an hour. And I had one thought, to get down. We had to get down. And that was occupied. Both Gambu and I had the same thought. Now we have to get down. We had no feeling of success, no feeling of having made it, no feeling of relief. No, we had to get down. It wasn't until three days later when we got into base camp, we finally I looked over Gambu. We made it, Gambu, and that was the first good feeling I had. With supplies nearly depleted, Tom Hornbein and the late Willie Unseld made their own bid up an untried and dangerous West Ridge. It was just that need for the uncertainty in the adventure rather than simply maximizing the chances of getting to the top of the mountain. And when you get right down to the nub of it, looking back a half a century, among all the other things that uh, resulted in a successful outcome, luck played one hell of a huge role. You, real, you look back on our experience and realize that somehow everything unfolded just miraculously and we came back to talk about it. Five of the 19 Americans reached the summit. In a White House ceremony, President John F. Kennedy awarded the entire team the National Geographic Society's Hubbard Medal. But ask these mountaineers if it was a victory in the Cold War. I can probably speak for all three of us, but we, I certainly didn't give a damn about any of that. Some climbers, like Dick Pownall, gave up their shot at the summit for the needs of the team it still touches a nerve. Certainly a disappointment, but it was countered by the idea that we've had success, and the expedition was successful at that point. And uh, it was a team effort. Uh, in the beginning, you don't contract the idea that you're going to go to the summit. You uh, commit yourself to doing what you can to support whatever's going on. Exactly. And uh, at that point, we felt that we'd had success. And, uh, but yeah, and it's probably more of a disappointment as time goes by and you realize how close you were and uh, it could have turned out otherwise, but, but uh, 
That's okay, that's life. What they did and what Dick did, you know, I mean, what the hell? There was talk about teamwork right. and, and uh, uh, for the good of the team and, and uh, getting for the goal, doing, seeing the goal done and even saying, you know, yeah, he felt better that the, goal, the team had climbed it than that he did it himself. So, you know, what, what, uh, what greater sacrifice? That's perfect, wonderful. Here we are, 50 years later, there's a new book out about it. What do you, looking back, see as the legacy of this? Yeah, well, it's the friendships I've formed, these two guys that are here with me. Uh, you know, we since Everest, 50 years ago, we had a long and beautiful friendship. And so that's, that's a very important thing and a very big thing. And the other thing is when I came off the mountain, I realized what a small planet we're on and how beautiful it is and how lucky we're to be alive on it. And so I think every day is a gift and that we've got to get people outside into nature. Get the kids out. No child left inside, okay? Get them outside. Nature's the best place to be. And joining me is Brock Coburn. Welcome, Brock. Great to be here. Uh, you know, this is your sixth book, nearly all of them reflecting a really deep interest and personal involvement in the people and uh, region of the Himalayas. And But, you know, you begin your book with a childhood memory of a lecture by an explorer who came to your school. And what really caught your attention was when he pulled out a jar full of? His amputated, frostbitten toes. And I was in middle school in Tacoma, Washington in 1964 when my classmates and I were summoned to the <laughs> assembly hall in the classroom. We were told that someone was going to speak to us about Mount Everest. And uh, I didn't know where Mount Everest was. We didn't have internet or uh, social media. And uh, we were introduced to a man named Willie Unsold who would go on to be a legend to college uh, students as a philosopher and uh, uh, physics professor. And he showed slides of men with poet beards and uh, laser-like eyes climbing up and touching what seemed to me to be the edge of the stratosphere. So clearly it made an impression on you. It did. I, I, I was wondering not so much whether I could do that myself, but I was wondering who this man was and who were the people who were climbing with them. Uh, your newest book, of course, is The Vast Unknown, America's First Ascent of Everest. That was 50 years ago. What was it about that adventure that caught your attention? Well, in 1953, Mount Everest was climbed for the first time by the British. Uh, and in 1956, it was climbed by the Swiss. Well, there was a Swiss gentleman who had tried to climb Everest in 1952 before the mountain had ever been climbed before. His name was Norman Dierenfurth, and he hadn't reached the top. But he became a U.S. citizen in the 1930s, and he was committed to getting an American expedition on top of the mountain. And so he needed to find within the United States the equivalent of the right stuff. Now, a good part of putting that expe expedition together actually had a lot of Tetons connections, didn't it? Indeed it did. Uh, Norman came to the Tetons of Wyoming first, first and foremost. He was aware that there was a, a core group, a band of expert uh, climbers. Uh, some of them were referred to as SABs, or supremely able-bodied. Uh, uh, Barry Corbett, Jake Breitenbach, Dick Emerson, uh, Dick Pownell, uh, Willie Unsold, Dave Dingman. These are the, the names from the Tetons that the leader selected to go to Everest. And that was in 1963? 1963. And of course there wasn't, you know, that, that highly developed sort of routine. It's almost routine now. But then, all the routes hadn't been explored. 
and equipment perhaps was not quite as uh, advanced as it is today. The equipment was rudimentary, uh, down clothing was just being perfected by Eddie Bauer in particular, and also freeze-dried food was just uh, coming out at that time. Uh, concerning the route, what made that expedition uh, interesting and uh, especially uh, fascinating and impressive for mountaineers in particular was that the original intention was to climb the route by uh, climb the mountain by the standard South Coal route that Sir Edmund Hillary first did that Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay uh, pioneered in '53, but along the way it was primarily a core of Tetons climbers, uh, the group right here from the Tetons who got together and and thought that maybe there was something more daring and audacious than doing a standard route, and instead perhaps they could take on an unclimbed route on the mountain. And they picked out the West Ridge, the unclimbed West Ridge. Steep, uh, scary, difficult, uh, never traveled before, and uh, they weren't sure at the same time that there would be enough equipment, especially supplemental oxygen, for them to undertake two routes at the same time. So there was a bit of divisiveness within, mm. within the expedition. And you know, uh, over all of this is the fact that uh, you know, we're into the Cold War era and there's uh, a definite uh, overcast of, of you know, superpower striving for, uh, I guess, to reach Everest. Well, a lot of people don't uh, remember, especially younger people, or, or realize that the early 1960s were a time of great uncertainty in America. Uh, we were facing the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the um, space race, uh, uh, children were taught to duck and cover in the event of a nuclear uh, missile attack. Uh, and America was afraid that Russia might beat uh, uh, the United States to the moon. And that's when President Kennedy vowed to put a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. And in his famous moon speech, he invoked the great climber George Mallory, who was lost on Everest in 1924. In 1960, the Chinese did stage an expedition to Everest with over 1,500 members, and they claimed that they put three 1500. people. Yeah, 1,500. They claimed they put uh, three people on the summit, except that they arrived on top at four in the morning in pitch darkness, and so there's no photographic evidence that they really did reach the summit. So at the time, that climb was discounted by the mountaineering community. But admittedly, Jim Whitaker and Nawang Gombu, the first two to reach the summit with the American expedition, they were afraid that maybe they would have to uh, uh, quietly kick off the bust of uh, Chairman Mao uh, that the Chinese claimed that they placed on the summit. Now, uh, during this climb, this expedition, there was a very dark time. It was the death of uh, Jake Breitenbach on the ice fall, and his body couldn't even be recovered. What did that do to this tight-knit team? Well, unfortunately, Jake was uh, crushed ben beneath an yeah. apartment-sized wall of ice on the second day of climbing. And I recall that Dr. Gil Roberts, uh, who was roped to him, had to cut the rope with a knife, the rope that led underneath the uh, fallen block of ice in front of him, uh, tons of ice. And so the expedition retreated to base camp and they asked themselves whether they should go on. And they did decide to go on. And they decided that they would climb the mountain, not without Jake, but they would climb it for Jake. Well, of course, uh, an American team did make it to the top, the regular route. Whitaker and uh, Gombu? Now on Gom Gombu. Okay. Yes. And uh, that was much applauded, of course, but it was really the hairy kind of ascent from the uh, other approach, the, uh, the West Ridge, that was uh, um, at play here, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, it was. Uh, once Whitaker and Gombu had reached the summit, now it was the turn for the climbers on the West Ridge, most of them Tetons climbers. 
and they had to forge a route up onto the west shoulder right below this rocky prominence and they set up their tent uh, right below the rocks on a spot that uh, Willie Unsell described as uh, almost impossibly smooth and he realized that it was so smooth because it had been scoured by uh, hurricane force winds. Well I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because there is a passage that is absolutely terrifying in your book uh, on their fight with the mountain uh, where the wind actually lifts the tent and starts sliding all of them down slope and they finally as, as uh, one of them said there was nothing to do other than helplessly try to execute a self-arrest with our fingertips through the floor of the tent. I guess that kind of experience will stay with you. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> At least they were trying to self-arrest when they weren't being tumbled over and over like <laughs> clothes in a, uh, in a dryer. <laughs> you know, um, Hornbein said, I felt no gratitude that we had escaped with our lives, only awe at the power unleashed on us and a dissatisfied finality to all of our dreams. But it actually didn't end there. No, it didn't, uh, although it almost did. Uh, the climbers regrouped. They decided that their West Ridge attempt would have to be abandoned. But Hornbein, Tom Hornbein, stayed up all night, and he figured that if they only attempted to send two summiters to the, to the top of Everest, and if they eliminated a, a high camp, that maybe they could make one last desperate attempt on the summit, and then, they would have to traverse the mountain and descend on the other side by a route that they had never seen before. Up and over. Yes, because they knew that it would be difficult, probably impossible, to uh, descend or repel down the route that they had come up. The rock on Everest is uh, very um, soft and uh, flaky. So when that final summit had been accomplished and they kept going, was that more or less the end of the adventure, or was there still trouble awaiting? Well, in a way, it was almost beginning. Uh, on May 22nd, Tom Hornbein and Willie Unsold reached the summit of Everest, but they did so at 6.15 in the evening. And so they had to descend the southeast ridge uh, with no idea of which way to go. But they saw footprints in the snow, footprints that could only have been made by two other climbers who had hoped to intersect with them on the top, Lute Jerstad and Barry Bishop. But the problem developed when they uh, intersected at night, uh, their flashlights were dead, the batteries were shot, uh, they intersected by calling out in the darkness, and just below 28,000 feet, they had to bivouac, they had to spend the night on one of the windiest places on Earth uh, at uh, 27,000 feet. And uh, from that experience, uh, Barry Bishop and Willie Unsold would lose their toes. Uh, apparently, uh, they had to be uh, carried out. The teams of porters, as you write, competed like Roman charioteers. Having survived the mountains, the riders now wondered if they would survive the downward <laughs> journey courtesy of those porters. Indeed. Uh, well, they were, they were lucky to get out to the staging village of Namche at 12,000 feet, where a helicopter came in and was able to evacuate them. So, you all met at the White House. There was a big ceremony with JFK what, uh, you know, the, for the party. How was that for the team? How big a deal was that? Well, uh, they the team was awarded the National Geographic Hubbard Medal by John F. Kennedy in the Rose Garden of the White House. And normally the Hubbard Medal is given only to an individual each year by National Geographic. Norman Dierenforth, the leader, insisted that every member of the expedition received the medal, along with five of the Sherpas who were brought to the United States on something of a goodwill tour. You know, um, of course, the story doesn't just end with a, a White House ceremony. There is kind of a strange, unexpected final chapter uh, involving Chinese atomic tests and the CIA recruiting the climbers. Uh, give us the short version of that. Well, the short version is, is that one of the team members was uh, cornered by uh, Chief of the Armed Services General Curtis LeMay at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C. 
And LeMay was uh, concerned about rumors that the Chinese were undertaking nuclear missile testing in Tibet, uh, north of the Himalayan range. And he was wondering if the American climbers and the Sherpas on that expedition could be recruited to plant a plutonium-powered surveillance device on a high Himalayan peak that could gain visibility into what the Chinese were up to uh, on this salt pan uh, in the middle of Tibet. Was there an actual line of sight? Almost a line of sight, two or three hundred miles, but it was oh, sufficient it, for their radar. See the, uh the atomic cloud anyway. Yeah, yeah, at least. <laughs> well, of course, afterwards, uh, you know, in and afterward, uh, as you conclude the book, you say, nowadays, it's as if those who are going to Everest don't really want to climb it, they want to have climbed it. It's, yeah. that's, that sounds very regretful. Well, it is. Uh, the reasons why people nowadays are climbing Everest are uh, varied. Uh, some people are uh, climbing it for um, spiritual reasons and self-discovery. Some are climbing it to um, explore how strong they are. Uh, some want to uh, include it as a bullet point on their resume. And some perhaps as a form of uh, penance others as uh, recreation. Well, Rob Carbon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Richard.